when we're talking about differentiating and integrating a power series, <clears throat> we're talking about differentiating and integrating it with respect to x. Okay, with respect to that, that variable that's part of the convergence. So if we take a look at something, and here we have an x minus c here, so here we have a Taylor series. And the Taylor series is always the more general of expressions because we could always let c equal 0. And then if we did let c equal 0, it would reduce this expression to a to the n x minus 0 to the n. And so, you know, kind of make that note that Maclaurin is a special instance of Taylor. It's when c equals 0. And so when we have this real general expression, uh, we have a Taylor series here, and we can expand it. And, of course, when we take a derivative here, we're talking about bringing down the power and reducing it by 1, you know, bringing down the power into the coefficient spot, reducing the power by 1, and then doing any... Um, chain rule that needs to happen inside the brackets. Um, it's, e it's easier to see from a differentiation standpoint this one. Uh, for instance, if we would take the derivative, so take the derivative of this series uh, with respect to x, then that would look like, um, <clears throat> and, and the summation sim symbolism just keeps coming along for the ride here. So it would be a to the n, or a, the, a, a sub n times n x to the n minus 1. So that's, that's taking the derivative of that series. We're just doing the power rule on the x, on the x term, basically, just like we would do uh, when we take the power, or take a derivative of anything with respect to x. So differentiating a Taylor series looks like um, bringing down the power n, and then uh, x minus c to the n minus 1. And then, you know, also acknowledging that the derivative inside here is just 1. So when we do the chain rule, it's really times 1, which, you know, doesn't change the expression. So that would be like taking the derivative of each one of these terms individually. So taking the derivative of a constant would be 0. This would be just a sub 1, because this, this would be to the 1 power, the first power here. So it'll be a sub 1, and then 2 times a sub root 2 times x minus c, and then 3 a sub 3 times x minus c squared, and so on and so forth. So taking that derivative is just like differentiating term by term as we would on a polynomial expression. When we're talking about integrating, of course we have a constant of integration when we do that. Um, and so we're applying the, uh, the reverse of the power rule here. So we're bumping up the power by 1, and dividing by that same number. So uh, that's the same as saying, well, if we integrate each one of these term by term, we'll get our constant of integration. Our a sub o term will have that x minus c expression next to it now, divided by 1, if you wanted to write that. Our a sub 1 term would have our a sub 1 times x minus c squared over 2, and so on and so forth. And so, um, and so this is just basic integration technique like we would see it normally. Okay, so and, and so we're just applying the, if, the differentiation and the integration rules. So what it says then, and this is the really important part in terms of uh, intervals of convergence, which is what this section is about, and that is <clears throat> that the radius of convergence um, is only a function of the series. So, um, in other words, the radius of convergence never changes. Um, it, it is what it is based on the power series, based on the series you have. So if you differentiate it or if you integrate it, you know, differentiating and integrating, all that's doing is taking away a constant or putting in a constant. And so um, we're really, we're really going to have the same radius of convergence. Okay, the only thing that it's going to happen, since, di since differentiation will eliminate, since differentiation eliminates constants, um, then what differentiation does to, um, to a, um, a interval of convergence 
is since differentiating eliminates a constant, we see that right here, right? The a sub zero term goes away. Uh, di differentiating a power series eliminates eliminates an endpoint um, in the in the interval. So, in other words, it changes a closed bracket to an open bracket. When we integrate, since integrating introduces a constant, that's the whole idea. When we integrate here, we introduce a constant of integration. Um, when we integrate a power series, we are going to introduce um, a, uh, um, an endpoint. Okay, so to kind of show that symbolically, when we differentiate, when we differentiate, we're going to eliminate an endpoint. So in other words, what was a square bracket is now going to be an open bracket. And when we integrate, we introduce a constant. So we're going to, when we integrate, we introduce an endpoint. So what was open would now be included or closed. So that's what we see in our in, it has, as far as our um, modifications to our intervals. And so what that means then is if we take a look at if this is a function and we want to know, we want to describe what's happening with the function and what's happening when we differentiate the function and what's happening when we integrate the function, which we could also write like that, um, then uh, all we really need to do is find the interval of convergence of the original series and then make the appropriate symbolic adjustments to those endpoint brackets <clears throat> um, when we differentiate and integrate. So we're going to go ahead and look at the series like we looked at the other examples um, and do the ratio test on this. So um, our a sub n term and uh, so we're going to let red be the function here. Our a sub n term then is just what we see here. We're going to we're going to ignore the uh, the alternator, so it's three to the n, x minus two to the n over n, and our a to the our n plus one term looks like three to the n plus one, so one more multiple of three, um, x plus or x minus two to the n plus one, so one more expression there, and then n plus one in the denominator, one more number there, and so we kind of want to acknowledge that. When we see this here, we know we have a tailor. Uh, we know we have a center at 2 because we have this tailor pattern set up here. So we know um, that when we get the final um, interval that our center here is going to be 2. We're going to be centered about that. Okay. And so let's go ahead and do the, the uh, limit um, as n approaches infinity. So let's go ahead and do the ratio test. Uh, and I will set this up as uh, the reciprocal. Um, so a to the n plus 1, which is 3n plus 1, x minus 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, times the reciprocal of this, which is n uh, over 3 to the n, x minus 2 to the n. That's going to be less than 1. And, uh, and you know, it's a lot of algebra at this point. So when we look at uh, canceling here, we've got one more mul uh, multiple of three up top here. So we have, uh, we have all the canceling of three to the end on the bottom, and we're left with an extra three on the top there. Um, when we look at the canceling here, we've got one more expression of x minus 2 up here. So we've got x minus 2. And uh, all of those cancel out. And so as we look at the limit, uh, as n goes to infinity, um, <clears throat> then we're left with 3 times x minus 2 times n over n plus 1. And, um, and so if we look at that as n goes to infinity, um, we can look at, again, dividing by dividing by the highest power of n, which looks like that, I'm getting a little more compact. 
when I do that. And we could also do L'Hopital's there. We could say this is 1 and this is 1 by doing L'Hopital's. Um, so we've got 3 times x minus 2 times 1 uh, over 1 plus 1 over n. And so as n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to 0. So we just are left with 3 times x minus 2 and is less than 1. And so what we can do then is um, we can go ahead and divide by 3. So we're left with the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1 third. And so at this point, you can, you know, if, you, if you're really good at solving absolute value equations, you can solve those two equations if you want to. But really, this is how I look at, at solving this. I say, here is my center. My center is 2. Here is my radius. My radius is 1 third. So I'm going to go and graph my center on a number line, and I'm going to back off a third and go forward a third. So if I back off a third, I'm going to be back here at 1 and 2 thirds. So 1 and 2 thirds is 5 thirds. And then if I go forward a third, I'm going to be at 2 and a third which is going to be 7 thirds. So there are, there are my endpoints. So now we have to decide for this function, do we or do we not include those endpoints? So let's go ahead then. Um, if x is equal to 5 thirds, and we plug that into the expression up here, what happens? So if x is equal to 5 thirds, then we have this series. Um, and we have um, minus 1 to the n plus 1, 3 to the n, and 5 thirds minus 2 to the n over n. <coughs> so we have to evaluate that. And so if we look at this, really, we, once we see this is over n, we, we start thinking it's a power series. Um, and the idea is all of this stuff up here in the top is just a number. We just have to figure out if it alternates or not. So um, we're going to simplify this a little bit. We're going to um, we just have to figure out if we have an alternator or not. So we have minus 1 to the n plus 1. That's an alternator. And then we have 3 to the n. And then we have 5 thirds minus 6 thirds, so we have minus 1 third to the n, and all over n. And so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to continue to rewrite this, because what I want to do is I want to get, um, I want to I see if I have negative 1s and if I have an alternating power up here. And I can pull a negative 1 out of this. And so when I do that, I've got negative 1 to the n times 1 third to the n over n. So if you notice, there's a, there's a lot of algebra that goes into this. So I have negative 1 to the n and I have neg uh, to the n plus 1 and I have negative 1 to the n. So combining those, since they're like bases, I've got negative 1 to the 2n plus 1. So we have to determine if that alternates or not. And then 3 to the n <coughs> times a third to the n <coughs> is, um, so 3 to the n times a third of the n is 1 to the n. Right, 3 times a third is 1. So that's just 1. So does this alternate? And um, so when n is 1, this is 3. When n is 2, this is 5. So again, we're asking ourselves, does it alternate? So n equals to 1. Then 2n plus 1 is 2 times 1. 2n plus 1 equals 3. So n equals 2. 2n plus 1 is now 5. So if you notice, it's always odd, which means it's always negative. So does it alternate? The answer is no. It's not an alternating series, which means it's a p series. And p is equal to 1. p is the power of n. And so this diverges. So we know that at 5 thirds, 
we have an open circle. Okay, so now we have to take a look at what happens at 7 thirds. And so you can see that this gets a little bit involved. So now let's take a look at what happens at 7 thirds. So when x is 7 thirds, we're going to plop 7 thirds into here. So we have the, um, the series as n goes to one, from 1 to infinity of minus 1 <coughs> to the n plus 1, 3 to the n, times 7 thirds minus 2 to the n over n. Okay, and, um, and so we have to, again, we, we have to ask ourselves, does, we're going for does this alternate? So we have to do a fair amount of algebra here to determine if we have an alternator or not. Here, this is an alternator, we know that. We have to determine if we can flush an alternator out of here or not. Um, so 7 thirds minus 2 is a positive 1 third to the n over n. And so 3 to the n times 1 third to the n is just 1 to the n. If you notice, a lot of the simplification is repeated. And so, um, so does this alternate? The answer is yes. We are stuck with an alternator here. So does it alternate? The answer is yes. So we know that an alternating series, um, we can look at this and we can take the limit. We can take the limit of 1 over n as n goes to infinity, and that equals 0. And we can take a look at um, a to the n plus 1, and that is less than a to the n. That's also true. So, um, so we, have a, um, we have a convergent alternating series here. So that means we can go all the way back up to this number line and we can include this. Change that to red. Okay, so we can include that. Okay, so we have something that looks like that. Or in interval notation, we've got something, oops, wrong bracket. We've got something that is open at 5 thirds and closed at 7 thirds. Okay, so that's for the function. And let me just kind of grab this here. Okay, there we go, and group that and copy it. So if we talk about our function, if we talk about our f of x. <coughs> Okay, if we talk about our f of x, we know that this is what we get. Okay, our function has these endpoint conditions. Okay, so if we, we try to kind of set this up in some organized fashion, if we want to take the derivative of this function, so I was going to try to color code here. Um, the derivative is green. So if we were going to take the derivative of <coughs> this function, um, in other words, an f prime of x, we know that um, we know that um, we'd have the same center, and we'd have the same interval of convergence. But we don't. We would have. We would have to lose any, at least one closed endpoint, and we only have one closed endpoint. So we would know. Um, oops. We would know then that this closed endpoint would no longer be closed. This closed endpoint is now open. So this now would be opened up. And 
So we would have two open endpoints because we know that when we differentiate, we get rid of constants. And when we get rid of constants, we get rid of endpoints in the interval notation. And I'm not good at drawing a nice line here. There we go. So, um, and I'm just trying to change this circle now to green. There we go. So now we have a situation where um, where we have um, both open endpoints. So we're talking about then having five thirds and seven thirds, both with these rounded brackets. And if we're talking about integrating this function, then uh, we know that <clears throat> that's going to add endpoints. So if that's going to add endpoints, then, um, then we're talking about now filling in this endpoint. So now we're talking about, let's see if I can just get rid of this here. Now we're talking about taking this open endpoint talking about taking this open endpoint, getting rid of it, and closing that up. Because when we integrate, we add constants of integration, and adding a constant of integration adds an endpoint. So this becomes filled in, and um, this stays filled in because it's already filled, and that can all be blue now. And so that now becomes an interval that has two closed endpoints. Um, and so the idea then is if, if you're ever given a series and asked to differentiate and integrate it, <clears throat> and integrate it you really um, only, you really don't have to do the differentiation and integration you really can just look at the interval of the original function and then take away the endpoint where you need to and add the endpoint where you um, where you need to. Um, the only the only caveat is if these were both filled and we asked for the derivative, then um, we wouldn't know which one to take away unless we went back and did our endpoint tests on the derivative. So that would be the only um, the only uh, part that might require a little bit of work. So a, a, at this point, a couple of scenarios would be if we have the function, and let's say we have filled filled for the function, then if we took the derivative, which one do we open? We don't know. It could be. It could be this, or it could be this. We don't know. We would have to check endpoints. So we'd have to um, we'd have to take the derivative of the of the series. You know, we're using the power rule and check the endpoints to see which one could diverge and which one converged. You're only going to lose one. Okay, if you, if you took the second derivative, then you would definitely lose both. So a little caveat there. Um, if we took the second derivative here, then we would have definitely both open. Because each time you take a derivative, you lose another endpoint. Um, if we had both of these filled in and we integrated, we would have no extra work. Because once they're filled, they're filled. So these would definitely stay filled. Um, so that's kind of a bonus there. <clears throat> Um, another scenario would be if these were both empty, then if we took the derivative, we would know that we definitely have both empty because they're already empty. And every time you take a derivative, you lose endpoints. You can't lose any more endpoints. So it would just continue to look like this. But then we would have this problem over here. So we, once we integrated, we could have this scenario over here. And, um, and so we would, again, have to integrate the actual function and then, um, and then set up uh, the endpoint test to determine which one we would open up. 
And if we took another integral, then it would, they both, or which one we'd close up, excuse me. If we took another integral, so if we did a second integral, um, little caveat again, if we took a second integral of f of x, we would definitely have this because then, then they would both be filled at that point and for every other subsequent integral.